Yep. All right. All right, guys, so we're going to do a run through of the effect size p values in Power Lab again. Me and Andy actually already did this, but we, figured, we apparently there was a snafu and it didn't get recorded. Um, so we're already, we've already done the lab. Um, it was kind of a wild ride, but the, the advantage is that now we can do a quick run through. Um, <clears throat> so, what we're doing in this lab is we just want to sort of study the effect, uh, study the, the interaction between effect size. Uh, sample size and power and how varying you know each one of those parameters affects power and how they're related So to start off we're going to import these functions that we stored in the flat iron not sets pi These are the functions that you did in the lab the labs prior to this um, It's got the Welch's T and the p-value and all of that stuff um, So now here's what we're gonna do uh, we're gonna have okay so the first of all we're going to create this helper function and it's going to help us generate random samples um this it's going to generate two random samples from two normal distributions it takes in six input parameters the first three are the parameters of sample one the the, the other three are the parameters of sample two m1 is the first mean s1 is the first standard deviation n1 is the size of the first sample and the same with m2 s2 and n2 that's all for the second sample Simple enough. Uh, so we define our function that takes those six parameters. We're just going to say sample one is equal to np.random.normal. That's going to pull uh, uh, randomly select values that are normally distributed. Uh, the mean will be m1. They'll be distributed around that mean. The standard deviation will be s1, as put in there. And then the number of uh, random selections is going to be determined by the size parameter, which is n1. Same for sample two, and it's going to return these two arrays for us sample one and sample two. All right, so now this is the meat and potatoes of this lab. We're gonna run a simulation, right? We're gonna investigate how the p-value of an experiment relates to the sample size when both samples are from identical underlying distributions. Um, to use this, uh, use your generate samples function along with p-value Welch t-test function. Uh, use sample sizes ranging from five to 70. For each sample size, simulate 100 experiments for each of those experiments, you're going to generate two samples of the given sample size. Each sample should have a standard deviation of one because, like we said, that you know we're pulling samples from identical underlying distributions. Uh, the first sample should have a mean of five, and the second should have a mean of five, plus the effect size that you hope to detect. So, and we're going to go through a range of effect sizes. We're going to increase the effect size through each iteration to study what happens when the second sample is like further and further away from the first one. Um, <clears throat> we're going to calculate the corresponding p-values for the Welch's t-test for each of these sample pairs. And finally, we're going to use the p-value to calculate the power of the test. Remember, for all the simulations where effect size is not equal to zero, the null hypothesis is not true. Um, store the overall power uh, uh, with the corresponding sample size and effect size. Use varying effect sizes such as this, uh, and then you'll plot power versus sample size for various effect sizes. Um, and this is similar to what you saw in the README where they um, have, you know, this kind of chart. Um, and there's like a native method within stats models that helps you plot this to sort of determine, um, you know, what's your optimum sample size for a given level of power. Uh, and we're kind of doing that in this lab again. Um, except we're doing it using a frequentist approach where we're going to actually pull like actual, you know, sample actual values and plot them out. So our lines are going to be just a little bit more wonky. Okay. Um, so this is our main code chunk. So here's how we start out, right? First, we're going to put all the effect sizes in this list. Okay. Um, we can put the sample sizes in here. I started doing this and then later on I switched because they do it differently in the solution. So um, let's just comment that out. So ignore that because we're gonna do it differently later on down the line. So now here's the tricky part that we ran into a lot of trouble with because we figured this part out, like the, the core math of it, um, but we just weren't building our data frame right. Um, so the way that you build a data frame is that you're first going to declare a dictionary called p versus uh, e n, and basically what that is going to do is that it's going to store um, the it's it's going to be the effect sizes. It's going to be the 
power for each sample size for each effect size. Um, and and uh, you'll see the structure better down the line. But okay, so we specify our alpha. Um, our, our, our end data frame is gonna be a dictionary of dictionaries. And this is the first level dictionary and this dictionary is basically gonna contain the columns and those columns are gonna be each effect size that we see. So 0, 0, 0 0.01, 0 0.02. Um, and you'll see, you see that down here in the final data frame. That's what our final data frame kind of looks like. We have effect sizes going up as the column names, and then we have sample sizes as the index labels. And we want to see, you know, for a given sample size, you know, how does the power vary as the effect size increases? Or conversely, for a given effect size, how does the power vary as we increase the number of samples that we take, or the, or the size of the sample that we take? Um, and that's what we're trying to assess that relationship and we're going to plot that out. Um, so to start off with, we're going to do our, it's, it's basically a series of nested loops that we're doing here. Um, the first level loop is for effect and effect size. So we're going to iterate through each one of these effect sizes and then we're then going to next iterate through each sample size, right? And the sample size is going to be uh, for size and range uh, 5, 750, incremented by five. So this loop is going to take a sample of, of five things. It's going to sample with a size of, in this loop, the sample size will be five the first time around, 10 the second time around, 15, and so on until it hits 750. So we're increasing our sample size in increments of five. Um, and we're going to increment the sample size for each effect size. So bear that in mind. Um, Okay, so once we select a, sa a sample size, we're gonna proceed to try to get our power. And we do that by first, we're gonna initiate a blank list where we will store the p-values that we find, um, which is to you know keep track of whether or not we're rejecting or accepting the null hypothesis. Uh, we're gonna initiate a blank uh, dictionary called row. Um, actually, no, we're not, because this is a holdover from my previous attempt, so we can, I think we can just safely delete that. So ignore that. Uh, so we're just going to initiate an, a blank list, which, can, which is going to store the p-value um, for each observation, you know, for the, the sample that we pull um, in each experiment. So now we're going to we're going to uh, pull 100 samples, right? Or well, actually 200 samples because we're going to do 100 experiments. In each experiment, we're going to pull two samples. Um, we're going to specify the parameters of each sample, so it's going to randomly select samples. And we're going to tell it, well, you know, for the first sample, the mean is five. For the first sample, the standard deviation is one. And um, the size of the sample is given by size, which, remember, is this level of our loop right here, because we're going to iterate through the sizes. Um, and then the next time around, it'll select the bigger sample and so on. Uh, then for our second um, sample, for, for our second sample that we pulled for this experiment, the the mean is going to be five plus the effect size because remember that's our like alternative hypothesis and we're trying to see you know as you know the the alternative hypothesis mean is bigger as the second population's mean is greater i.e as the effect size increases what effect does that have on power so we're just going to do five plus effect and again recall that effect is our top level loop so in each iteration effect will increment um, to the next um, member in the effect sizes list. So then we can study as we increase effect, um, how does that you know, affect power? <clears throat> so that's the mean of the second sample. Uh, standard deviation is one, because again, the question says that we're gonna be looking at uh, when both samples are from identical underlying distributions, so the variance is the same. And again, the size is also gonna be the same. Um, so uh, I'm not really sure why they're using a Welch's t-test because it would seem that a t-distribution would be sufficient. But then conversely, I was thinking, I mean, why not always use a Welch's t-test? That's an interesting question that I think might be worth exploring. Um, all right, so that's, we, we got our two samples, right? The first and the second, they each have a different mean. Uh, so now we're gonna calculate the p-value, uh, which is gonna be determined by running a Welch's t-test on sample one and sample two. Uh, and that will tell us the probability of, of observing a sample that is as with a mean as large as the second sample's mean 
assuming that the first sample is normally distributed, right? Standard p-value definition. Uh, once we get the p-value, we're gonna append it to the empty list that we initialized above here. Um, then we're gonna calculate, um, we, this is gonna give us, this loop is gonna give us 100 p-values, right? So we're gonna run 100 experiments. Each time it's gonna pull a new set, two new samples. Um, and you know, sometimes the p-value will be low, sometimes it'll be high, depending on you know, the randomness that's inherent to the sampling process. Um, but now that we have 100 experiments, we want to look at, well, when we ran these 100 experiments, how many times was the p-value uh, uh, smaller than five, i.e. how many times did we reject the null hypothesis? Because power is a probability. Um, and we, and it's the probability that basically it's the probability that we're going to reject the null hypothesis when it is in fact, um, false. Uh, and it's, so it's expressed as a probability it's between zero to one. Um, and to get that probability, we're basically going to say, well, we're going to sum up the number of times that we rejected our null hypothesis, i.e. the number of times the P value came out less than 0 0.05. And we're going to divide that by the total number of p-values that we have, i.e. the total number of experiments we ran. We ran 100 experiments. Of those 100 experiments, how many experiments resulted uh, in a p-value that was so low that we ended up rejecting the null hypothesis and affirming that, like, you know, the two samples were, in fact, from different populations, i.e. there was a difference between the two. Hey, Khan. Yeah. Just as a, as a, as a reminder, um, those two lines are redundant with the subsequent line, right? So we ended up just... It is. Yes, thank you. Right. Yes. Just and a reminder, uh, we did some struggling, yeah, but it's essentially did. the same thing. Right. It's doing the same thing. We were trying different, because we, we ended up looking at the solution, uh, and we weren't exactly sure why we were getting an error initially, so we tried incorporating different um, things that they did differently. Um, but essentially, this, this was, I think, my line, and that's the line in the solution. They both achieved the exact same result. And it turns out that the error that we were making had to do with how we were constructing the data frame, not so much the core uh, mathematical calculations of it. Um, so yeah, so you can, you, can, you can do it either this way or you can do it how they did it. Um, you know, they just do it in a one-liner. I kind of broke it apart into first I, you know, get uh, the sum of the number, basically, this is, this is the number of times that the null was rejected, and then here we just divide that by the total. They do it in one line where they just do np.sum, they do a list comprehension, and they do one for every time the p-value in p-vals was less than alpha, um, which is essentially the same as what that is. And they divide that by the length of p-vals, which is what I do here. But, but Andy's absolutely right. This is redundant, so we can just comment that out. Thank you, Andy. You're welcome. Yeah, I ran it with those commented out. It was, clearly, it was fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so then we can, that's gonna, so that, and that, so that's gonna bring us back um, our power, right? And then that power gets stored in the n versus p dictionary, and the key is gonna be the size. So basically, what this is gonna do is it's gonna store in this dictionary for each size, for each sample size, it's gonna store, okay, well, if the size is five, the power was found to be this. And then it's going to do that for each size. And that's going to be a key value pair. And that's important because that's how the data frame gets built. Um, because that is our series, basically. Um, and then once we're out of this loop, i.e. the size loop, once we have iterated through all the possible sample sizes and we found what the power is for each possible um, size, sample size, um, at that effect level, we're going to move to the next effect size um, and then repeat that this loop again and calculate how, okay, so now that the effect is greater for each sample size, what's the power? Uh, and that's going to give us our columns and that's going to be our main dictionary where we're going to just put, you know, the key is going to be effect um, and that's just going to be the, it's going to hold a dictionary. The key is effect, the value is a dictionary and the, the, the value dictionary is this up here because that's your series. So once that's constructed, just simply create a data frame, power df is equal to pd.dataframe from dictionary, pass in the dictionary that we have here, which is a dictionary of dictionaries. Um, and that's gonna give us this data frame right here. Uh, and it's gonna it's, see it's showing us how, as the effect size goes up, as the sample size goes up, 
the power goes up. You see that diagonally. And right around here, it just hits one because these are like at the highest effect size and at the highest sample size, the effect size, the, the power is like one, which is the highest the power can get. And now we just plot that out and take a look. And that's, that's how the plot comes out. And it sort of corroborates what we understand about power and its relationship to sample size and um, effect size. And we see that, you know, um, each line is the different effect sizes. Um, and you see that, you know, two is this pink one. And this pink one, it increases in power dramatically with even a very small sample size because the effect size is so great that you know it's one of the variables that increases your power um, but then as the effect size goes down and you see the purple line which is now 0 0.5 we see that we're going to need a slightly larger sample in order to maximize the power of our test and so on and so on as the effect size decreases the requirement for the sample size increases to compensate and even then you may never always be able to compensate um, or you'd have to take a huge number of samples to hit to maximize your power um, yeah, and that's, of course, that's not always feasible. And then, then I guess in every study, we have to sort of balance considerations between, you know, we can't always sample such a huge, uh, popular, we can't have such a huge sample size. Um, but at the same time, we want to, you know, get, um, conf get evidence of our hypothesis. So we have to balance those things out. So that is how that lab went. Andy, do you want to walk through, uh, your questions that you had? No, actually, I got it to work. One thing to keep in mind is yeah. keep an eye on what kernel you're running the <laughs> the lab in. Really? Details, details. Not kidding. It didn't work in yeah. one of the kernels I was running. So which one did you change to? Python 3 or what? Um, no, I was in Python 3 and I went back to the learn and it worked mm. for some reason. So strange, but it would not work in Python 3 for me. Mm. That's your base. All right. Well, fair enough. Okay. So there's that. Um, so yeah, I guess that about does it. One thing yeah. I was going to ask when you're looking at that graph. So ideally you want the, um, you probably point two, correct? I mean, that would be an ideal situation. Uh, point like taking two? a step back? No, 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 no. I would say the ideal is point 0.5. That's that because it, it's like, you know, um, it's a small enough, okay. So, you don't feel like it's like a compromise, like to do a point two? It's always a compromise, but see the thing with point two, point two is, which one is point two? Let's see, point five is your point two. Point two I is guess. the red one, where you yeah. still kind of keep, yeah. it's kind of you do a yeah. trade off where you're not That's sacrificing true. That's everything. True. Well, well, see, right. So yeah, you're right. It depends on, on how small of an effect you want to measure, right? Um, and, and that means that, like, you know, if you want to detect even small changes over the null hypothesis, meaning that, like, so if you go back to the example of where they were trying to assess um, the effect of medication on liver fat, right? Their null hypothesis was that, you know, after taking the medication, the liver fat percentage will be the same as if you didn't take the medication. And then they want to dispute that by saying, no, well, they took the medication and there was a change in their liver fat. So now effect size comes in where you want to like, like how much of a difference are you willing to take as proof that the medicine is having some effect, right? So if I take the medicine and my liver fat goes down a little bit, right? Now there's a chance my liver fat just went down randomly or because of something other than the medicine. Um, but you know, if I want to be like, that's fine, but I want to make my test more sensitive to detect those like, decreases in liver fat and if it does find that decrease in liver fat it's going to assume that the null hypothesis is false that's where effect size comes in so if we want to measure a small effect then we're going to need a larger sample because that's going to give us better results it's going to increase our power because if a large number of people are experiencing a small reduction in liver fat after taking the medication that makes it more likely that the medicine is in fact you know, reducing your liver fat. But if you take a small sample size and you notice that your small, small sample size has a slightly lower liver fat percentage, that could just be like a normal deviation around the population mean. Um, so that's the relationship. So I think it really comes down to what each experiment demands, right? Ideally, I think, I think from what I understand is that you really ideally want to have as many, as large a sample size as you can afford to have. 
I think that's the best thing to do because like, you know, they told us before even that like the larger your sample gets, your like the sampling distribution of the sample mean also gets narrower. Right. And, and, and the, the, the sample mean becomes closer and closer to the population mean. So in a perfect world, you would try to get the largest sample you want, you know, and, and try to maximize that out. But of course, you can't always do that because you have resource limitations on, on getting data on a large enough sample. So then you have to compromise well, you know, so that means I can't really detect small changes. I have to content myself with like finding proof of slightly larger changes. And that's going to be my proof that, you know, there has been some change over what the normal situation is. Does that make sense at all? Yeah, agree. Cool. Great. All right. So point two, yeah, I see what you're saying though, because it does seem like um, you could get you could get 700 people, and you can you can even if like at point eight, right? Like point eight is an acceptable level of power. That's what they told us in the material. It doesn't have to be one. Um, you know, they're happy. If, I think one is unrealistic to yeah, always obtain, yeah, right? Probably, it's like probably. in the real world, you're yeah. not going to get one. So I probably feel like. Not. Like yeah. a point two, you're still yeah. retaining some power, yeah. right? Well, but yeah, well, also the reason that I went with um, point five is because they said that um, in in the in the readmes they seem to indicate that thirty is like a good sample size, and that's where your t distribution almost starts to acquire a normal distribution, anyways. Um, which is why I went with point five because it appears that that. Um, 0.05 the effect size it seems to hit a 0.8 power level at a sample size that's like around 30 to 40. So that's why I said that maybe 0.05 might be a good place. Um, but if you want to narrow if you want to make your test more sensitive and you want to detect a smaller change i.e like a 0.2 change between the, the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis or, or the two samples I mean then you would want to like, you know, select a smaller effect size, but then to compensate for that smaller effect size, you're going to want to get a larger sample size to hit that point level, which is going to be like yeah. 300 or so. Now I follow. Yeah, yeah. agreed. Cool, cool. All right. Awesome. Uh, Andy, thank you for joining me again. My apologies for not recording it before, but I almost feel like it worked out better because we sort of had a succinct summary of the whole thing instead of... Yeah us like fumbling through code. yeah like hacking our yeah. way through it as but, fun as that was and i kind of still wish that we had it because that was a, that was a fun process but still yeah the touchdown when we get it to work at the very end that's really always fun. the best part yeah i know all but right i feel like you can get the concept better when we just yeah take a yeah. step back and i feel like i understand yeah. better and taking yeah. a step back and looking yeah. at the actual right plot. right like going over it one more time after having gone through it it kind of like reinforces and consolidates what we did so far so i agree with you awesome all right thanks no worries all right see you around please be recording